Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes so thank you for listening and <sighs> let all my yawns out before I start. So this is going to be a recording. It's going to be titled with some it's going to be recording. But it's going to be titled, You're Going to Be Okay. So that's, that's it. That's not, that's not the whole recording. I mean, that's, that's the title. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And there may be background sounds as there was, I just bashed the table in. Also, we've got a lot of rain and wind outside at the moment. 70 mile per hour wind, apparently. Uh, so, but it's okay because you could just relax and listen to me. Uh, if you're sitting in a chair, please make sure that the chair has sides to it. So that you don't, you know, if you did fall asleep, you didn't fall out of the chair. So that's important. So ideally don't listen to this if you're balancing on one leg. You know, just... Because if you did fall asleep, you want to make sure that you're safe. Safety is important. If you're lying on your bed, there's a chance that you will fall asleep. I mean, I'd guarantee that if I was actually talking and lying down at the same time, of course that's difficult for me to do two things at the same time, but I would fall asleep. Which is why I have to sit in a chair when I make recordings. I have walked about in the past whilst making these type of recordings but it makes a little bit of noise you know it's, yeah a little bit of you can hear the footsteps and stuff like that so I try and just sit down um, wow this is boring isn't it wow I should put this on my let me bore you to sleep podcast so what do I mean by it's going to be okay? It's going to be okay. Well, I think it's a sentence that we all need to hear. It's something we all need to hear. That things are going to be okay. Some people will already be in that mindset and they may say, Of course, it's going to be okay. And good for you. A lot of people will not be in that situation. And some people will be maybe listening, thinking, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, it's going to be okay. You don't know my situation. This, 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 this happened. This has happened. This has happened. And you're right. I don't know your situation. And I believe regardless of what's going on, you will benefit and I will benefit 
from hearing those words, it's going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. And you could dissect it and say, well, I've just finished a relationship. That's not ever going to be okay. Which is a good point. But you're going to be okay. And you need to believe it. Not just hear it. However, the more often you hear it, the more you start to believe it. That's, I mean, this is the flip side of verbal abuse. The flip side, the opposite. If you live with someone that's telling you that you're ugly and you're stupid and all that stuff, for years on end, you're hearing that daily, some people start to believe it. And it's not their fault that they believe it. It's because that's the way the brain works. That's the, it's, it starts to become embedded. And that's the way hypnosis works. Is by just offering a suggestion, but you keep repeating it. You know, the idea with hypnosis really is that I'll make the suggestion in a recording, for example, like this, and I'll mention it. And instead of just saying it, I like to, in this type of session, I like to go in depth exactly what I'm talking about and where I'm coming from and what I mean by the words that I say as opposed to just being uh, an empty cliche or just saying it for the sake of it. Now, I don't make recordings just for the sake of it. There's better things I can do. There's stuff on telly I could watch. I could go back to bed and have a sleep. There's, you know, there's loads of things I could do. So I'm not doing this to waste my time by just saying stuff that is pointless. Although I do say a lot of pointless stuff. But the idea of just saying, you're going to be okay. Just for the sake of it, I'm not going to do that. And the more you hear those words, you're going to be okay. Even if at first you push them away, or you think, oh, that's a load of bollocks, absolute crap. What's this bloke talking about? He's talking out of his ass. You could think that. Doesn't change the fact that you're going to be okay. And there's more chance of you being okay when you wrap your mind around this idea. Wrap your mind around those words and notice how much better you feel when you say those words to yourself when you say those words to yourself internally 
course you can say it externally you can look in the mirror and say I'm going to be okay you can have it written on your wall on a you know, piece of paper or a pen or whatever you know I'm going to be okay or you're going to be okay I've got on my door in my living room on one of the wooden bits of the door I've got written in capital letters in a marker pen I deserve to be happy it's been up there for about a year and a half and I see it every day and it's true I do deserve to be happy and at the end of most of my recordings I tell people be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy and I deserve to be happy I'm not telling people something that doesn't apply to me why wouldn't you deserve to be happy so why shouldn't things be okay in the future and also based on that logic why shouldn't things be a bit crappy now and then or really difficult in fact whether physically, health wise physically, mentally whether relationship wise uh, bereavement other losses, jobs, uh, problems with finances, all that kind of stuff that everybody's going through in some way. You know, if you've got a cluster of friends and family, you could probably fill most of those gaps up with at least one of those people. There's going to be someone that's physically ill. There's probably going to be someone that's got mental health issues. There's going to be perhaps someone with financial issues. Someone that maybe has a phobia. Someone that perhaps unemployed. Uh, perhaps relationship problems. You know, it's going to be spread out. There's going to be one example of possibly so many different possibilities of let's, let's face it suffering but at the same time if you look around you're going to see people that examples of people that have come through that and are now doing okay because things were okay in the end for them. I mean, anybody that's in a second marriage, but one of those people, I'm guessing, I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the majority of people that are in their second marriage never believed that they would ever get married again in fact they were probably awfully opposed to the idea at some point earlier in their life I think it's fair to say there are millions of people who have overcome physical illness, serious physical illness, including this year with the coronavirus. You know, there's millions of people have had that illness and recovered. And at some point during that period, they may have thought, well, if you had said to them things are going to be okay, they would have, or had they not been too ill, they would have laughed. 
but actually they might have been too busy trying to grieve. I had a friend that went through that. Couldn't breathe and you know, he was on oxygen and everything. He, he didn't believe he was gonna survive, but he did. But you know the benefit of hearing me say this to you? This is something that might sound a bit strange, but there's, there's some truth in this. The benefit of hearing, and I, now I know that some of you feel that you know me a bit. Uh, you might have been listening to me for quite a while. So I'm not a complete stranger to everybody that listens. I know, well I know from the stats that I've got a, a loyal audience. People that listen regularly and I'm hoping benefit. But I'm also, compared to your husband, wife, child, grandparents, friends, I'm pretty much a stranger compared to the people in your life. So it's easier, I guess, in okay, case so I'm guessing this, but I think it's probably true, it's easier to hear from me the things are going to be okay because you can't lash out at me because I'm here I'm not there with you not physically there's a connection there's an emotional there's an energetic there's an energy there's that connection energy wise and I do like the idea that all of us are kind of together, listening, and we're all connected and kind of helping each other at the same time. It's all the thousands of people that listen to this podcast are almost helping the recovery of the other people. That's, that's, it, I know it sounds a little bit up in the air there, a bit airy fairy maybe, but and I'm not really spiritual. But I like that idea. I'm very open to knowing that I don't know loads of stuff. There's more stuff I don't know than I do know. So, you know, I try. I do mock stuff sometimes, but I try it not in this serious way. Because there's so much that I don't know. And there's so much I'm never going to know. There's also a huge amount that I don't want to know. I've just got no interest in. And it's hard to devote yourself to... You can't devote yourself to everything. It's a choice sometimes. But going back to what I was saying... You can get annoyed at me, you hear me, you might be in the middle of a divorce, you might be in hospital, you might be having problems with the finances, maybe the unemployment benefit hasn't been paid or all that kind of stuff, which is horrible. And I've been in various of those situations. Um... It might be due to stress, anxiety. You might be having panic attacks. Um, just affected by, because that's what this podcast is about, isn't it? About the stress, anxiety, tension, panic, all that stuff. But it's more than that. There's more to it. It's, you know, so much of how we feel is affected by our environment. Because, so let's, uh, for example, I had some, like many other people, I had a uh, part of my childhood was very traumatic. And I would say, there's no way of knowing for sure, but there's, a, you know, the bipolar and the, the mental illness that I've had is potentially hereditary based on the 
based on the family, if that makes sense, based on, you know, the examples. Uh, without going into too much detail. So, but the environment does have a huge effect as well. I'll give you an example. I woke, this is a few months back in the, probably before the summer started, but it was nice enough to sit in the garden. So we're probably talking about May time. And I, I go in the kitchen and I see an ambulance downstairs, but not downstairs, it's in the garden, it wasn't in the garden, it was outside in the road. So I go downstairs and my friend's door was open. So I knock and I go in and he's there on oxygen. This is when he had, uh, was really ill. And then I was told to get out by the paramedics because the paramedics were there with masks on and they, I wasn't allowed to be in there. So I got out. So I was upset at that regardless of rules we're still human you know and and then because I wasn't allowed in there I wasn't able to see how he was getting on so he was in there probably a couple of hours they were there with him so I ended up just going up coming upstairs and I could not get myself calmed down I was honestly at a level that I've not been for quite some time and I couldn't figure a way to you know there's a lot of anger there which surprised me and I felt really angry probably because I don't like being told what to do which is, I know it's quite childish, but it's also human. But he refused to go to the hospital. But I'd know if I'd have been there, I could have talked him round to go to the hospital because that's what he needed. And he was worried about his dog and his flat. And I, and I said to him, I can look after that. I can look after your flat. I can look after your dog. But because he was didn't have anyone with him, just the paramedics. He had to make those decisions himself and he wasn't thinking straight because he he was ill. Lack of oxygen, he was almost delirious. So the environment really affected me and if someone came up to me and said, don't worry, it's going to be all right. That might have pissed me off. But it might have grounded me. Which I think is what's useful sometimes to hear a stranger say it. Someone that's not directly involved in your life someone that's not going to bring up anything from your past because I don't know anything about your past someone that's not going to judge you can't, I can't judge you, I don't know you so it can be a benefit from that from hearing someone say that things are going to be okay Not right now, but they will be okay. And you might think, well, how, do, how, do, how the hell is that going to help me? Well, part of the stress, the emotional pain, if you break it up into three parts, the same as with physical pain, 
emotional pain, emotional pain, break it into three parts. You've got the past emotional pain, the present emotional pain, and the future emotional pain. So by saying things are going to be okay, you can get rid of a third of that emotional pain straight away. And then you've got the past emotional pain. It's not necessary. You don't need that. If you focus just on what's going on now, which means you've got rid of two thirds of the pain. And you might think, yeah, but I've still got that. I've still got that to deal with. But you take two thirds. If you, if someone's got a toothache, and you take two thirds of that pain away from the tooth, that person's going to be happy. Someone's got a broken leg, and you say, well, I tell you what, I can take two thirds of the pain away. Do you want that or not? They're not going to say no. They're not going to say that's not enough. Because two thirds of the pain is a huge percentage. I'm trying to think what the percentage is. It's 60, 66.6.6.6 percentage. Might, you might think, well, how can I get rid of the past pain? You know, if this is a relationship issue, for example, or let's, let's, if we focus on anxiety uh, or panic attacks. I've had panic attacks in the past. I'm having panic attacks presently, not now while you're listening to me, but, you know, at other times you've had them. So the logic with our logical brain we're going to have them in the future. That's the logic. That's That makes perfect sense. Really. Logically. You know, is But then we, we base it on stuff that is almost, first of all, out of our control. The only things that happen in the past, happen now, and happen in the future guaranteed to happen are things out of our control uh, one would be bodily functions you go to the toilet you do a poo in the past you do a poo in the present you're going to do poos in the in the future I like to go to, to the toilet humour so that's a fact you breathe, you, 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 breathe, you breathe in and out in the past, you do it now, and you're going to do it in the future. You ate in the past, you're going to eat now, in the present, and you'll eat in the future. Those things are out of your control. So that's a different, different ball game to physical or emotional pain or uh, anxiety or panic or any of that stuff including you know relationship breakups uh, job losses uh, bankruptcy uh, physical illness Just because you had it in the past, in the few in the present, doesn't mean you're going to have it in the future. And the simple fact is, if you've had it, the past is, you know, half an hour ago, ten minutes ago. That's the past. So you can let that go. You don't need that. It's not relevant. But the future. The future starts now. And I like the idea 
that every second of every day you can choose what you do next. I've said this quite a few times over the years. You can choose what you do next. And it doesn't feel like a choice most of the time. It's a lot of automatic behaviour. And I do understand why. For some situations like driving a car. Or even you know, doing your shoelaces up. Or getting ready for work in the morning. A lot of things will just be automatic. You know, a process. Uh, or it's like a behavioural pattern. You do this and you do that. Then you do this. Uh, like eating your dinner. You pick up the fork with your left hand. The knife with your right hand. And maybe you eat a certain part of the plate for... You don't eat the plate, but you know, certain parts of the food first and then others. And it might be a routine that you're not even aware of. I mean, I've got a routine where if I have muesli, it's the only time I do this really. If I have muesli, I love Alpen. So if I have muesli, and I, have, I always have one cup of coffee in the morning. And that's generally the only coffee I have. I used to drink a lot of coffee when I was working in insurance. But I don't drink much now. And I will have a mouthful of muesli. Which is cold because it's got milk. And then I'll have a, a mouthful of coffee. There's something about that cold and the heat and the mixture, the tastes, which I just like. Now, I just want to point out, I don't have like a big, massive mouthful of muesli and then pour the coffee in and it's dribbling everywhere. You know, it's just, it's quite a neat performance. It's not, you know, not gross. But I didn't notice I did that. Until I did. You know, I noticed like, oh... I know a few years ago, because I've been living on my own my whole life, really, apart from when I was a child. And I noticed one day that I was eating with my mouth open. Now, I was taught not to do that. I was taught to eat with my mouth closed, and I thought I still did. And I was going, and I was like, wait a minute. What on earth am I doing? I didn't know I ate with my mouth open. Now I don't normally, I don't think. It just happened, it happened to be that I caught myself doing it. And I've gone back to eating with my mouth closed. Because I don't want to be going into a restaurant one day and, you know, be on a date or be with someone and I don't really want them to be looking at my mouth, the inside of my mouth as I chew, you know, like I was almost like a washing machine going around. The food just being churned up. I mean, that's just gross for the other person, I imagine. For me, it's not going to affect me. Well, it's going to affect me <laughs> in other ways, probably. So what do we mean by things are going to be okay? And what do I mean by saying it's easier for you to hear it from me than to hear it from someone else? It might not be. You know, if someone's really close to you, it's very, you know, and if you really, really trust that person and you believe what that person says to you, it's going to mean a huge amount to you if you can take it on board. If you trust them and the person says to you, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And you believe it. 
that's more powerful than any than listening to me. Of course it is, because that person has an impact on you that a stranger will never have. It's a different kind of impact. But sometimes people don't always know what the right thing is to say at the right time or at the wrong time. And I'm, I'm definitely in that category. I, I don't know what to say. I had a friend witness to suicide the other day. Just, you know, I don't even know what to say to him. I'm a, trade, I'm a trained counsellor. And I still... It was just because I, I wasn't expect well he wasn't expecting either but I wasn't expecting to open the door and hear the story that he told me and if I'd have said to him because he, he was he was traumatized by it which is I'd say the most understandable reaction is traumatic to be a witness to something like that. He, well, I said to him, well, things are going to be okay. I think it would have sounded false and it would have sounded like I just maybe was trying to end the conversation. Now, when I do this recording and I say things are going to be okay, that's the start of the conversation. And you know with me, it's quite often a very, very long, laborious, oh, so boring <laughs> conversation. In the end, you just have to give up and say, okay, I'm going to accept it. Things will be okay. I got through this. I got through listening to Jason for an hour and a half or two hours. Like, yeah, things are going to look up from now on. So maybe that's the gift that I give boring people into thinking differently. Think differently. And yeah, maybe. But all these different people that you know, you might not know their past, but if you delved into their past, all of them would have had a point in their life where they thought that things were over, or they thought that they wouldn't be able to recover emotionally from what has happened as I said whether it's an illness whether it's relationship issues financial issues uh, the list is endless yet they all came out the other end and I had a friend who her uh, she married her boyfriend just before he went into a hospice to die. Basically, they got married. He was terminally ill. I did some hypnosis with him for uh, yeah, just just to help him a little bit. This is a long time ago, two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. And he died, and she, if you'd have said to her, and I, I didn't say it to her, but if anyone had said to her directly, things are going to be okay, especially if someone had said, oh, you'll meet someone new, which is probably the worst thing to say to someone who's just had a bereavement. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to be cheered up. They want to feel 
they want to feel it. They don't want to feel it, but they kind of do it at the same time. You know, people that have lost someone close to them, they don't want to feel good. It's not natural, is it? At the same time, they don't want to have the the pain they're going through either. It's a very, it's an unusual situation. And I had to, uh, a friend try and cheer me up when my nan died. And she said, I'm trying to cheer you up. I said, I don't want to be cheered up. You know, it annoyed me, but she was being kind. That's the bottom line. She was being nice. She was trying to, she cared. But I didn't want to be cheered up. And I didn't want to hear things are going to be okay. Not from her, not from someone that I knew. But when you hear it from a a weird, strange man like myself, you might start to think, oh, okay. It feels different hearing it from me than it would do hearing it from someone else. And also, the more often you listen to this recording, the more it goes in, the more you start to embrace the ideas that have been presented to you, and your mind wraps itself around the idea that actually the future is going to improve, things have to change, because things always do change. Nothing stays the same. I mean, if you live to be, you know, a million years old, you might say, well, nothing's going to change. I'm going to stay in the same house and everything like that. Well, the house is going to crumble around you through time. That house is not going to be there in a million years' time. You might still be there, but your surroundings won't. You know, the change will be phenomenal. So things are always changing, whether we want it to or not. And it's one of those ironic things, isn't it, in the sense of We love the idea that things constantly change when we're feeling crappy. You know, if you've got a, let's say, you know, a broken bone, you know that the pain is going to subside over the next few days, over the next few hours, you know, it's going to just continuously reduce, maybe not noticeable at first. But to the point where you still got the plaster or the sling on your your leg. But it doesn't even hurt anymore. You're just not able to put any weight on it for a few weeks. And it's nice that things change. You think, yeah, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad things don't stay the same. But if you're doing something really pleasurable, whatever it might be for you, personal, for everyone, isn't it? But you're doing something really, really, really pleasurable, you might wish that time would stand still and things never changed. It's kind of the, you could say, an analogy of you could make love, make love to your husband or your your boyfriend, uh, for example, and wish that it'd last forever because you're so enjoying it so much. But then you get pregnant and you give birth. 
and your whole concept of time changes and you're wishing, I wish that things would change very quickly and that this pregnant, this birth would hurry up. Rather than be lasting for hours and hours. So it's, you know, we can't have it both ways. I think that's the bottom line. We can't have it both ways. So realizing that things are always going to change. And that's what gets us through. Because if someone, let's say it's a lady, I don't know why I'm saying the word lady because I'm talking about giving birth, so it's kind of got to be a lady, isn't it? A female, a person giving birth knows that the the birth process will eventually be over and they will be presented with their baby or whatever the end result is you know the, the actual process of the birth will conclude if it wasn't for knowing that the pain would be unbearable. And I know someone would say, well, it was unbearable anyway. I'm talking emotionally unbearable. Who would be able to handle the pain of birth? Let's say some people don't have the same level, but if you, you know, I've heard it's not the most comfortable experience. Um, I think someone said it's try, trying to poo out a bowling ball or something so but regardless of that if you had that feeling and you knew it was going to last forever imagine what that would do to your mental health it would be too much wouldn't it so we deal with stuff like that, knowing that it's going to change. Things are going to change. So we're well aware of it on many other different scenarios. We're aware that things are going to change. You're aware, I'm aware. So it's, it's not alien to us. It's not a new idea. Just like indigestion. Indigestion is horrible. I have um, acid reflux, so I have to take a tablet. But when I get indigestion and heartburn, honestly, it's really quite horrible. But I know it's not gonna last. So it doesn't emotionally affect me. It annoys me. Now it doesn't happen very often, but I know that it's not going to last. But I also know that I will get it again in the future. You know, it's, it's just it's the same with... It's not completely the same, but it's kind of the same with depression for me. When I'm not depressed, I know that when I do get down, that it won't last. When I'm in a depression, I'm not so in touch with that. But because I remind myself when I'm feeling okay, that when I, you know, the times when I'm not feeling okay will pass, it won't last, that things will change, things will be okay. I will be okay. And I think it's about what you do when you're not in that situation. It's like people meditate. It's not so they can feel relaxed 
or have necessarily have peace of mind when they're meditating. It's fairly easy to do that. Uh, okay, not for everyone, but for most people, just sitting down, and the idea of meditation, some people think you have to empty your mind, and it's not about that. It's about just sitting there. It's about noticing what you're thinking. Uh, it can be just counting. It could be just noticing your breath. It could be thinking positive things towards other people. It could be various different techniques. But the main idea of meditation is how it affects your life when you're not meditating. That's the point of meditation. It's not so that you can feel calm just in that moment. Because if that was the case, then most people that really get a lot out of meditation would never want to do anything else. But the simple fact is that it does help outside. It helps throughout the day to feel more relaxed and I guess the same as these recordings uh, let's say a, a relaxation session where I'm just guiding you for a relaxation and yeah it feels nice in the moment but also f you feel more relaxed during the day and maybe you feel more relaxed in the evening maybe you feel more relaxed tomorrow because of that letting go of all that emotional stress being relieved from your body and your mind you have the extra benefit of experiencing more peacefulness and more of a sense of emotional comfort, uh, positivity in your day to day life outside of that hour that maybe you were listening to me. You can experience more relaxation and reminding yourself not only that things are going to be okay, but also that you can choose what you do next. You can always choose what you do next. See, right now I could press the pause button and have a drink. I could just have a drink. I could drink quietly or I could slurp the drink purposely just to amuse myself. I could get up and start tapping my feet, pretend to be a tap dancer. I could open the curtains. I could go into the bathroom and shave my hair off. Not that there's much left to shave off. I, you know, there's, there's infinite amount of things that I could do next. When normally I would think my life is being quite slow and with not many really op options of what to do next. But the reality is there's loads of things I could do. There's loads of things that you can do next and you choose ultimately what you do next. And when you like, notice that maybe you're on automatic, you can turn the automatic off. And I think that's what panic attacks and high anxiety often is it's an automatic 
response to something that requires a manual response or it's an automatic reaction when actually it requires a manual response. And you can turn the automatic off just as you've got automatic pilot, automatic navigation on cars and things like that. But you still need to be there. You can't just stick the plane on an automatic pilot and go for a nap. You still have to be there to, you know, in case of an emergency to make sure things are going okay. So you get to see when you're in the pilot seat, the cockpit, whatever you want to call it, you get to see what's going on as it happens. Just in the same way as when you're on automatic mode, auto mode in your life, you're also there with it. You get to see what's going on. So instead of just reacting automatically, you can go to manual and choose what you do next. You can respond manually. Or you can change those presets. Those automatic presets, which perhaps until recently, maybe until now, have been set to react in quite an extreme, emotional, tense, anxiety way. Change that so that you react differently. Have a fail-safe in there. Have a diversion. So it might go to, you know, oh, time to panic. And then it gets diverted to, okay, time to go to manual. Let's just have a look at this. Which is why some people are really, really, really good at their jobs because they work calmly under pressure and they say yeah that's fine they know what they're doing they're an expert on what they're doing and they sort it out they don't run around screaming and shouting and annoying everyone they say, yeah, okay, this is what we need to do. And they get it done. And it's sorted. So if you think about it, you're the boss of you. You're the boss of your life. You're the boss of your body. You're the boss of your mind. So you're the boss of what you do next. You're the boss of what you think about. Which means that those processes that occur that you've had on automatic are being carried out by your employees that you have employed. You've hired them to do that job. To deal with those certain situations. So if you worked in a factory. If you, the, if you were the boss of a factory. And you had an electrician. An engineer. 
and the factory had a huge conveyor system, conveyor belt, and everything was about that conveyor belt. You know, if the conveyor belt broke down, the whole place came to a standstill and started costing money. You know, the company start losing thousands of pounds an hour for every hour that the place was, you know, not working. So you can employ an engineer that loses his head, starts shouting, screaming. He gets the job done, but in the process, he pisses off all the other workers. He causes anxiety within you. It's hard to be around someone that's shouting and yelling and... It's, it's quite difficult to be around someone that's really, really anxious without, personally, I find without feeling some of that. Being around someone that's very angry, with I get anxious when I'm around people that are angry or argumentative, and you know, that's, that's my natural kind of reaction or response to that. Or would you rather have an engineer? that stands up and says to you it's going to be okay I'm on it I'm going to get it sorted everything is going to be okay and you believe you believe her you know that she does that job She's the engineer, and you know that she's always done what she said she's going to do. And she always tells you it's going to be okay. And you know it is. So instead of watching her, instead of running around flapping about what's going to happen next and worrying about the money that's being lost, you can just go back to having a cup of tea, maybe go and have some breakfast, maybe watch some television, or just maybe get back to what you were doing before, whatever it was, without even needing to think about it. Because you have complete trust in that employee. Which is why you thank that employee and make sure that they know that they are valued. Which is why I think it's important for all of us to actually show ourselves that we are valued. To show appreciation for those processes that work for us. Show appreciation for your mind, the part of your mind that keeps you calm. The positivity, to feel grateful for the positivity that actually, well, if you go to the extreme, possibly gives you a longer life. By being positive, means that you're very likely to be healthier. You're more likely to make better life choices and to live a happier life. So to thank that positive side of yourself, however weird it may seem to say thank you to yourself, no one else is going to know. I promise I won't tell anybody. <laughs> I won't, honest. It shows kindness. And ultimately, you're saying thank you to you. You're not really saying thank you to a different part or something outside of you. You're saying thank you and you're being grateful 
to yourself. And there's a feeling that comes with that. I'm not sure maybe you can feel it now. Just say thank you to yourself. Thank you to your mind. Or thank you to my mind for everything that you do for me. And just sit with that for a few seconds. Maybe repeat it a few times out loud or internally. It's up to you. If you listen to this at work and you're sitting on a toilet, maybe don't say it out loud. That might sound a bit strange. They might think you're talking to your bum. Thank you for everything that you do. You know, it might be sound weird. But you say it internally and mean it. Maybe it seems weird. Maybe you laugh when you first do it. You're thinking, this is strange. Well, I like to flip things, as you might know. I like to flip things on the other side. It may seem strange being nice to ourselves. Yeah, might seem a bit weird saying nice things to ourselves. But how come it doesn't feel weird when we're being horrible to ourselves? How come that's okay? How come that's normal and that's accepted? Why should that be accepted? Why should that be normal? Why should we allow it to happen? That negative stuff we say to ourselves and we all do it on different levels you'll find that you do it less the more you listen to me the less negative thoughts that you have and the more positive thoughts that you have that's one of the side effects sorry about that one of the side effects of listening to me you feel different and sometimes you won't know why you feel different. And a lot of the times you may not attribute it to anything that you've listened to. You might just think it's what's well, happened naturally. And it has happened naturally. But you've helped it along the way. You're responsible for your own thoughts. You're responsible for your feelings. And I'm not talking about extreme situations. You know, you get some terrible, terrible news and, you know, you're crying. And someone says, well, you're responsible for how you're feeling right now. Well, no, that's just pathetic. Of course you're not. You're just, you're responding or reacting in a natural way that's natural for you. In the moment. When that turns into generalizing into the future, when that turns into, well, I'm going to feel this way forever, then that's your responsibility. That's your thinking. That's no longer a natural, a natural reaction. That's something that you've added to it yourself. I mean, you can think about it. I like I like being crass, if I can. You can think about emotions like a fart. You won't hear that anywhere else. It's like a fart. Feelings are like a fart. No fart ever lasts forever. 
even the best, juiciest, loudest, smelliest farts always come to an end. And eventually, admittedly, you might have to open all the windows or even knock the house down to get rid of the smell, but the smell will evaporate eventually. No feeling lasts. Which means you will be okay. Things will be okay. Even though they might not feel that way, you may not have that experience in the moment that, oh, everything's going to be fine. But it's not about how you feel. It's not about what you think in the moment. The most important thing is how you think the rest of the time. For example, when I said with a meditation, it's how you are the rest of the time. It's almost learning to feel relaxed, learning to have more comfort, more trust in your own abilities, to have more faith in yourself, to have more love towards you, to care about yourself. And to have trust that you can deal with whatever life throws at you. Pleasant or unpleasant. And the more you believe that when things are going okay or just neutral. I think we all have neutral days, don't we? Where things are just kind of samey same so if you just keep that going reminding yourself that things are going to be okay and then when difficult issues present themselves It's still going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. There's no easy. There's no easy bereavement. There's no easy marriage breakup. There's no easy uh, cancer diagnosis. There's no easy um, way to to deal with mental health issues. There's you know, there's no easy way to deal with losing your job or being made homeless. Those are not, it's not an easy solution for extreme things. In the moment. But when you have that foundation that you've built to knowing that things are going to be okay. That will be in the background. So you'll be on that foundation the whole time. Maybe not aware of it. All the time. Maybe completely oblivious to it and not able to get in contact with it at that time. But it still affects the way you feel. It still almost forms cracks in that intense emotional reaction that you may be having to whatever is going on in your life in that moment. Because the foundations may shake a little bit just to just to shake up that feeling. To remind you that that feeling is not solid. It's not 
made of stone. It's not going to last. And when you see it move or you feel it move, you get glimpses, you get reminders that it is a feeling. And even though it may be absolutely awful experience that you're going through, you will come out the other end. And you know that because that's what you have been reminding yourself of daily, every day. Regardless of what's going on, reminding yourself that things are going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. And it changes how you feel, even though you might not be aware of those changes. There are still changes. And it feels there's a, there's a sense of comfort. There's almost a safety net there that your nose there, but at the same time you're not really aware of it, but you kind of are at the same time. It's one of those mixed mixed feelings because in those extreme emotional times we're not thinking not thinking straight are we we're not thinking as clearly as perhaps we had previously yet we will think clearly again it almost feels like there's that feeling is that emotion, whether it's anxiety, panic, stress, tension, um, bereavement, hatred, whatever the feeling may be, that there's a breeze. So it's kind of made of sand, but not just sand, but hard sand. You know, the way like a compacted, like a sand castle. But then with the breeze, it blows a little bit off the outer layer. And then the breeze continues. Some more of it. It dissolves a little bit. But it's still in the shape of a sand castle. And, you know, maybe it doesn't look any different with, you know, with your naked eye. I don't know why people say naked eye. I've never seen one wearing a dress or a tuxedo. But you got, you know, it looks the same, but it's weaker. It doesn't have the strength that it had before because, first of all, it's drying out. So that moisture that was mixed in with it, that has kept it solid, it's now drying out so it's becoming flaky inside outwards so you're not aware of how flimsy that feeling is becoming so that thing that was almost felt like it was solid immovable here forever is in fact just a sand castle that's drying out becoming Weaker, flakier, and very, very likely to just collapse with 
with the slightest push. And that's what happens to feelings are the really strong negative emotions as well as the really strong uh, emotions connected to just really I don't know, horrible I don't know what the right word for it is but you know something like bereavement bereavement is not a negative emotion bereavement is a natural emotion to have someone loses their job and feels bad and feels you know really crappy it's natural it's not negative it's natural but someone thinking I'm never going to get another job and that's negative it's a different different thing So by dealing just with what's going on now, as the past is gone, the future hasn't happened. And when you decide that the only, the only future that you will allow is going to be a positive one. The only future that you allow will be a positive one. And you're going to be okay. And the more you tell yourself that, the more often you tell yourself, I'm going to be okay. And repeating that throughout the day, internally or externally, if you choose. You want to say it out loud, say it out loud. It's up to you. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. Word in it however you choose, as long as it's in the positive. So in other words, not saying things are not going to be as crappy in the future as they are now. That's a negative way to think of it. It's a positive idea in a sense of what you're saying is things are going to be better. So when you're talking about the future, you make sure that all of your language is positive. No negativity at all is allowed in the future. Because when you think about it, you're building the future before you even get there. You're building the city before you arrive. You're building the roads before you even use the roads. So, what kind of journey do you want to have? I mean, you could just put a dirt road in and have a crappy journey. Or you could put a really, really nice road in. It's almost like planning a holiday. When you plan a holiday, you don't plan it to be crap. You don't plan a holiday and think, oh, what can I get the shittiest hotel to stay in? You don't do that. You want to stay in the best hotel that you can afford. You want to get there the best way that you can. You 
if you're wanting to go and lay on a beach or go swimming or surfing, you want to find the best beach that suits your needs. You're not going to leave it up to chance. I'm just going to say, well, it doesn't matter as long as it's got water. And you end up with a beach that's just got plastic and poo floating in it. That's that's not what you're going to want. You want nice water. A lovely beach. A hotel that's beautiful. So you plan. So if you plan something with that much detail, a holiday for one week of your year, maybe of your life, you might only go on one holiday for a long time. Last time I went on a holiday was 2002. So if you plan this holiday with so much detail, for something that only lasts a week, that's not really that important, then doesn't it make sense to plan your future with more passion and more interest? And more positivity, endless positivity. I mean, look how people plan weddings. One day, one day, and it could take months to plan. Everything down to minute detail of the seating plan of all the guests. Finding out what everyone wants to eat. Maybe even down to the music that's played. Or the band that plays music. The photographer. The dresses. The suits. Tuxedos, whatever. Everything planned. For one day. So, why do we leave everything up to chance for the future? It doesn't make sense. You wouldn't do that for your wedding day, would you? You wouldn't just turn up to a church or to the registration office and say, yeah, I've come to get married. First thing they're going to say is, do you have an appointment? Did you book it? No, 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 we just come to get married and, and we're going to have our, uh, we're going to then phone up loads of people and we're going to sort of have lunch in that restaurant. Have you booked the restaurant? No, no, that, that doesn't matter. I haven't done that. Have you checked that your friends will be available? No, 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 we'll just give, send them a text. I'm guessing that most people would not organise a wedding in that way. So why would we leave things to chance for our future? Doesn't it make sense to plan? the future maybe not with that micromanagement that is possibly involved with a wedding but the level is up to you because it's your future only you know what you want
So that brings me to the end of yet another recording. You are going to be okay. Or things are going to be okay. I'm not sure which, which title I'm going to go for. So this is the end of the recording. I'd like to thank you for listening. And I would suggest listening to this as often as you can, daily. And notice how you feel differently, not just during listening to me, but afterwards and during the day, how you feel more positive towards the future and remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy and you are going to be okay lots of love